So your microphones are turned off to start. You will need to unmute to speak. Um, if you're joining via phone, just press uh, star six to unmute yourself. Um, and you can also use nonverbal feedback options, raise your hand or leave a message in the chat box if you have a question. Um, if you called into the meeting and you would like to raise your hand, just press star nine um, and then we will unmute. Unmute you. So um, just a reminder, um, if you happen to be driving, thank you for being able to join us, but please just don't look at your screen if you are driving. Um, I um, am joined here by several of my colleagues in Public Works and the Transportation Department. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jeff Alexis. To Good evening, everyone. Um, Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Alexis. I'm the principal civil engineer with the Public Works Department and Engineering Division, um, and also um, the project manager for the Cummins Highway Project. Um, with that, I will turn it over to um, Christy, who's, who's with us from the Transportation Department. Kirsty, sorry. Kirsty, I think you need to. Yes. Need to, hey, hey. Hi, everybody. My name is Kirsty. Um, excited to be here with you all. I work on the transit team at the Boston Transportation Department. And I am joined as well by Rob Guptill from MBTA, who's the head of service planning, the director of service planning. So uh, between the two of us, we should be able to answer your transit themed questions tonight. Um, and you all have met our lovely host, Hannah, so I'll pass it to Stephanie. Hi, my name is Stephanie Seskin. I'm the Active Transportation Director within the Transportation Department. Um, we have a couple of other people on the team who are here tonight as well to help us take notes, answer questions, um, and uh, in general, just make sure that we are responding to everything that you all are asking of us. All right, so the goals of tonight's meeting is um, we're going to share about how the city and the MBTA work together to design bus stops, what we consider when placing bus stops, what makes bus stops accessible, and um, example bus stop designs for Cummins Highway. Um, we're, and we're also here to share more about the Cummins Highway Reconstruction Project and answer any of your questions. Um, talk about the goals and recap sort of what is the work we've done so far in terms of um, engagement. Um, with that, um, once again, thank you everyone. Um, I, I'll provide you with a quick update on, on the Cummins Highway Project and where we're at. Um, we currently ended um, the trial on Cummins Highway in October of 2021. Um, and, and until construction begins, um, which we're hoping to happen um, sometime, hopefully next year, um, the end of next year, um, the Cummins Highway will remain as it currently is um, right now, um, which is what it was prior to the pilot. Um, but, um, but last year, um, and also during the pilot, we collected data on the traffic speeds, the travel times, um, and solicited feedback from residents and the community about your experience of the one lane in each direction. Um, if you have any questions, we ask that you please visit the boston.gov slash Cummins Highway um, website uh, to review the data that we collected. There's a lot of information about the project, um, the meetings that we've had in the past, um, the meetings that we've hosted in regards to the, the, the design elements that we were looking at for Cummins Highway. Um, we, we, we've also provided um, the community feedback that we received for the Cummins Highway project. So we ask that you please, um, if you want to look into Cummins Highway more and you, or you haven't, um, if you've missed a number of meetings in the past, please um, visit our website and you can find information there. Um, in regards to um, the Cummins Highway project, we are moving forward um, with our preferred design, um, but, it, but that being said, we will continue to host meetings um, throughout the year. Um, Cummins, can you please go back? Um, um, all, right. all right, so Cummins Highway. Um, 
we cannot produce this design without your input. We, we want people to be more involved. Um, people have been involved, but we want you to be involved in what we plan on doing and designing for Cummins Highway. Um, this design will essentially be what Cummins Highway is for the next 70 years. So we want, we want you to be involved and to shape how, um, how the design comes out. As I mentioned, we are currently doing community outreach to inform of what we can do to help put out the best um, design for this roadway. Next slide, please. So why are we planning to reconstruct Cummins Highway? Um, Cummins Highway hasn't been updated since the spring of 1955. As you can see, um, the streetcars ran, ran, around, ran along the road, um, which were removed in 1953 to actually make space for cars. The current street layout of Cummins Highway reflects the priorities of the 1950s, which was to enable non-residents to drive quickly through this neighborhood. So for the Cummins Highway reconstruction, what we plan on doing is, re is completely rebuilding the street. That includes the sidewalks, the curbs. We plan on installing new street lights and new traffic signals. And of course, we're gonna be um, um, repaving the roadway um, and replacing and updating utilities as necessary. As, as you guys know, um, if you've been on the Cummins Highway, National Grid is, is currently out there um, relaying, or they were out there, I mean, the winter, prior to the winter, um, relaying their gas main along the corridor. Um, the last thing we want to do is, is pave the roadway and have come as high we're looking fresh and new for a utility company to come in there and cut up the road. Um, so that's why we want utilities to come out there before we actually do any of our um, reconstruction. The city has, um, has budgeted approximately $24 million for the reconstruction of Cummins Highway. Um, this is a very large investment um, and, and we're hoping to put out the best project Best project um, for this neighborhood um, to, I mean, for, for years to come so that, so that the residents can enjoy it. So with the Cummins Highway Reconstruction Project, with any project that the city of Boston puts out um, from the Public Works Department, from the Transportation Department, um, our intent is to advance the goals of Go Boston 2030. That would include improving safety on our streets, reducing emissions, um, and ultimately investing in communities that have achieved equity and access to, and, and access to opportunities. We also work to partner with other city departments to advance our collective plans. We hope and work to inform residents of the work that's happening around the city. Um, and also we, we'd like to improve our collaboration and our work and achieve neighborhood and citywide goals. Lastly, we collaborate with the residents to advance your goals. At the end of the day, I mean, this is your neighborhood. You live here. You get up and, and travel and, tra and travel throughout these neighborhoods. Um, we, we want the community to be aware and participate in efforts that essentially that you care about. Um, and we hope to confirm your, your vision for what are the future projects, but the future your future um, through these projects. So kicking this off to Stephanie. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so again, my name is Stephanie Seskin. I work in the transportation department um, and I'm gonna be talking with you tonight about our work to plan and design bus stops for the um, Cummins Highway Reconstruction Project. So next slide. So as Jeff said, this is a completely new street that we're gonna be building. This means brand new sidewalks. Um, that are all concrete, they will be level, um, they'll be easy for people with disabilities to move along them. Um, every crosswalk is going to have um, a curb ramp that is accessible. Um, and as part of this, uh, we're gonna be rebuilding every bus stop on the corridor. Next slide. So um, we have met with the Greater Mattapan Neighborhood Council a few times to get some initial feedback on where we're going with the bus stop designs. Um, we made some changes uh, thanks to their input. Uh, we've also been coordinating with the MBTA um, on the best locations, challenges that they've seen on the corridor, uh, making sure that their feedback um, is incorporated into the plan. Um, so even though uh, we are working with the service planning team, again, the, the point of this call tonight is to really talk about the design and the location of the bus stops. Um, the MBTA's actual like number of buses that they run is sort of separate to this project, but definitely part of the conversation. 
So a few things that we think about when we um, are, you know, kind of starting with a blank slate the way um, we are with Commons Highway um, is that, you know, we need the bus stops to be close to where you all are, um, people who are going to take the bus. But if they're too close together, um, what happens is that the bus just is, takes forever because we're stopping every block. Um, so we have to find a balance between um, accessibility um, and uh, availability to nearby residents um, while also making sure that, you know, the bus can keep up with its schedule. So we looked at a few things to help inform um, where the bus stops should be for Cummins Highway going forward. Um, so the first thing that we did was look at census data, and I'm going to look at that a little more detail with you. Um, and we also looked at the distance between the stops. So next slide. So this is where all of the bus stops on Cummins Highway within the project area um, are today. Um, so again, we're really looking at for reconstruction, the intersection of Wood Ave at Harvard to um, about River Street uh, or like sort of fairway in that block. Um, so these are all of the bus stops that uh, if you went out today, um, you could catch a bus. Next slide. Um, so looking at where do we have a lot of youth, knowing that um, kids take the bus to school on a regular basis, um, we wanted to make sure that we had bus stops that served where we had the most number of youth. Um, on this map, you can see that darker blobby blue area um, that is south of Cummins Highway between Rugby Road and the Fairmont line is where we see the highest concentration of youth who live in the neighborhood today. Next slide. One more, there we go. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, we look at our elders um, and if they, uh, where they live on the corridor. Um, so we have a, a concentration um, sort of near the Alabama Way Bosset Greenfield Road area, um, which isn't a surprise if you know about um, where we have some uh, senior housing. Uh, but we also have some concentrations that are sort of south of Greenfield Road and over um, on the other side of Rockdale near River Street. Um, so we expect that those people will be, if they're gonna take the bus, they will be walking to Cummins um, from those areas. Next. Um, there we go. And then we also uh, looked at where people with disabilities um, live in the neighborhood. So um, we do have a pretty high population of folks who have at least one type of disability, whether that's um, uh, visual disability or physical disability. Um, and you can see that we have quite a bit um, just to uh, the west of the Rugby Savannah intersection. And then we also have um, some that are down by the uh, Rockdale River south of Cummins Highway area. We know that there's also an overlap between age groups um, and uh, disability. So um, we're also just trying to be thoughtful about um, how far people need to go to get to a bus stop if they're catching the bus on Cummins Highway. Um, next. So, um, and then as I mentioned, we do look at how far stops are spaced um, because if they're too close together, um, you know, the bus driver is constantly pulling over. Um, it also means that we can't use that curb space for other things like parking or loading areas. Um, so it is sort of a balance point um, to make sure that everyone can access it. But when we look at the bus stops that are out there today, how far they are apart is pretty wide ranging. You know, the, um, the bus stop could be, um, you know, a, a half a minute walk, or it could be um, a four minute walk. And so just trying to make it a little bit regular, more regular for folks um, is one of our goals here. Um, next slide. A couple of other things that we take into account is just the physicality of the bus um, and how it fits in the street. Um, so today, some of the bus stops that are out on Cummins Highway are too short. Um, the bus drivers can't get all the way to the curb without sort of sticking out into traffic. 
Um, or uh, they, the bus stop is after an intersection and the back of the bus is hanging into the intersection, which makes it difficult for folks who are driving um, to get out of those side streets or driveways. Um, and on top of that, um, as you probably know, if you've taken the bus or walked along Cummins Highway, a lot of the bus stops aren't accessible to people with disabilities. So the sidewalk could be in poor condition. Um, the nearby crosswalks may not have ramps. Um, there may not even be a nearby crosswalk over Cummins Highway itself. Um, so we think about that too, and how can we fit good bus stops into the corridor while making sure that you know everyone is still able to use the street. Next slide. Um, so with the reconstruction project, you know we have the opportunity to really make bus stops that fit the buses that are going to be on the corridor, um, fit your needs in terms of how close they are to where you live. Um, and make sure that the buses aren't blocking traffic or side streets, um, that there's really a good place for drivers to be able to pull all the way to the curb. Pulling to the curb is also super important for accessibility. Um, but to accomplish all of these goals, we do need to move some bus stops. Um, so next slide. Um, on this slide uh, are our proposals for where um, we should have bus stops for the new Cummins Highway. Um, and there's an interactive map that you can use to sort of zoom in and out and explore um, exactly where these might be um, and compare them to where they are today. But for the most part, we're keeping um, the bus stops um, very close to where they are today. They might be moving um, across the street. Um, or uh, you might have to walk a little bit further to get to the bus stop, um, but we know that there are important locations, populations um, that we need to serve with the buses, and we've done our best to kind of balance that along the corridor. Um, so the next slide will show you um, what we're thinking in terms of distance between bus stops. Um, and these locations do keep in mind all of the things that I just talked about, about avoiding driveways and having enough space for the bus to be able to fully pull to the curb um, while also still serving um, our populations of youth, elders, and folks with disabilities. So instead of it being anywhere between, on average, like a minute and a half to four minutes, we're looking at sort of two and a half to five minutes if you're walking along Cummins Highway. Um, but if you're coming from the side streets, for the most part, your trip isn't going to be any longer than it is today. Um, if it is, it's only by a little bit. Um, so we think that we've kind of hit the right point of access for all of you while still making sure that um, we can meet the goals that we need for accessible bus stops um, that are easy to use. Um, and that was a lot of information. So again, um, really please use that interactive map, explore it. You can send us questions anytime. This is not the end of the conversation um, and we'll definitely open it up for questions um, after the presentation. Um, so then uh, knowing that where we approximately wanna put bus stops comes the sort of more fun part, I guess, which is making sure that we're designing them to be accessible to people um, of all needs. So next slide. So um, every bus stop that we're going to build um, won't just be better for bus service, um, but it'll also be better for people who are waiting for the bus. Um, so we will have accessible crosswalks um, for every bus stop, both along Cummins Highway and near to where the bus stop is located. And we're planning for space to have amenities like benches or shelters, um, which I'll talk about too. Um, so the first thing to know, um, just in case you haven't been on the bus in a while, is that every single bus in the MBTA fleet is accessible. So if you have um, a mobility device or you use a wheelchair, you're able to get on and off every single bus that the MBTA has. Um, and there are a number of other accessibility features that are listed here um, that uh, you can explore the next time you're on the bus. Outside of the bus, um, that's kind of where we come in as the, the city um, transportation department and public works department. So there are a few things that we, we know we have to have for every bus stop. Um, so the first thing is that there is a difference between the sidewalk and any travel lane, whether it's a bike lane or um, a, a bus lane or just a general travel lane. 
Um, and for the most part, that means that we have a curb um, that you can tell um, if you're using um, a white cane, you're able to understand um, that this is the edge of the sidewalk. Um, we also want to make sure that we have plenty of space to deploy the ramps that are on the bus. So if you do have a wheelchair, um, the ramp can come out of the bus and you have enough space for that ramp to come down and for you as the wheelchair user to maneuver after you get off the ramp. Um, we make sure that the sidewalks are level um, and easy for people um, who are using mobility devices to get around. And then of course the back door um, is a really important door for a lot of people. Um, and so we need to make sure that there's clear space back there for passengers to get off the bus. Next slide. Um, one of the things that we've been asked about a lot for the corridor is think about bus shelters. Um, so obviously bus shelters are great for folks who are waiting for the bus because you can take a seat, you can sort of be protected from the elements, whether it's raining or it's really hot um, or it's windy. Um, so we're taking care to make sure that every bus stop we design has room for a bus shelter. Um, but um, just reiterating that we are still working on the details here. So we don't quite know what type of bus shelter um, we're likely to put on Cummins Highway, um, how they will be maintained, including who's going to shovel them um, when it snows, um, and then uh, if we're gonna be able to put bus stops at every, or bus shelters at every bus stop, or if it will be um, the ones that have the highest ridership today. Um, next slide. The other thing that we have been asked about is providing real-time information at the bus stop. So when you're waiting, you can see how long it's gonna take for the bus to arrive. Um, the MBTA has actually been working on this specific challenge for several years now and are currently rolling out um, this type of sign um, at many bus stops in the region and at almost all of the green line stations that are um, running along the surface of the road. Um, so this example here is on Warren Street in Roxbury um, at Quincy Street. So you can go take a look at it. Um, we also have some that are on Blue Hill Ave already. Um, so we definitely want to include these in the Cummins Highway project. Um, there are some more technical details that we have to work out, including whether there's going to be enough sunlight to power them at all of the stops. But we're working with the T to make sure that um, we're providing these um, at at least a few of the bus stops um, that we can. Okay, so how does all of this stuff fit together on the road? Um, that's a great question and one that we have been working really hard on for the last couple of months. Um, so I just want to start by saying the graphics that are on the screen are, are supposed to just represent what it could be. Um, it's not the final design and it doesn't include some things that we know we have to spend more time on like street trees and landscaping um, and other aspects of the design. So please don't think that these are final. It's just meant to help um, illustrate how the bus stops are going to work. Next slide. Um, so here, um, this is at 610 Cummins Highway near Kennebec Street, um, where we currently have um, a signalized crosswalk in the middle of the street, um, which we're keeping, and we're building the bus stops around that. Um, so you can see that um, the crosswalk um, is shorter than it is today, because you only are crossing um, two lanes of traffic right here, because it's in the middle of the block. Um, and it will have that traffic signal, but it will also be fully accessible. So it's very easy um, to roll up and down, whether you are pushing a stroller or you're in a wheelchair um, or pulling a cart of groceries. Along the side streets for Cummins Highway, we're currently planning raised crosswalks um, so that as you're walking from the bus stop back to your house or to your street, um, you will be up at the level of the sidewalk um, and drivers will need to slow down as they're turning um, off of the side streets or from Cummins Highway. Um, we also heard that you will want the buses to be able to pull all the way over to the curb and not block travel. So we're definitely making sure that there's room for that. Next slide. So zooming in just a little bit more, um, just to show you how some of those elements I just talked about will fit in the space. Um, so the red boxes next to the bus are those clear space zones at the front and back doors. Um, so the one at the front is 
um, longer. Um, and that's to make sure that there's room for the ramp and for someone in a wheelchair to be able to choose which direction they're gonna go in. Um, and then there's also clear space at the back door for folks who are coming off the bus there. Um, and uh, there's room for potential bus shelter, um, but there might also be room for those real-time arrival signs for a tree, um, for bike racks, for green infrastructure. Um, there's still a lot of details to work out, but we have the space um, to be able to make these really nice bus stops for you. Next slide. And so how this bus stop works with the bike lane um, is kind of new uh, to the Boston area. We have a few of these that have already been constructed and more that are on the way. Um, this is based on national best practice and um, really making sure that people with disabilities um, are accommodated at the full level um, before anyone else. So if you are coming along the corridor, you're just in the sidewalk like normal, there's nothing different for you, um, but you can use crosswalks to cross the street, um, across Cummins Highway, or across the bike lane to the area that you might be waiting for the bus. Um, and as I mentioned, we're providing quite a lot of space right at the bus stop. So there's room for folks to wait. Um, and if we have a shelter, they can. there's room for that. Um, there's also room if you, um, you know, are with your kids and there's a bunch of people, there's just going to be a lot of space there. That's just for people waiting for the bus. You don't have to sort of weave in and out if you are walking. Um, and then people on bikes will just continue in the bike lane um, unless there's someone who's um, crossing the bike lane. And that's on the next slide. So um, here, this is what happens when uh, someone is crossing to or from the bus stop. Uh, people on bikes will need to stop uh, for those people who are crossing the bike lane. Um, this is common practice and something that, you know, we need to build a culture around, but we don't have a lot of these in the city yet. So it's something that's going to take a little bit of time. Um, but we usually will put out some reminder signs. Um, you might have seen some of them elsewhere in the city. Um, but this is basically how it works is you just kind of look to your left um, or right when you're coming to or from the bus stop. Um, and if there's a cyclist, that person should be waiting for you. Um, and that's kind of the basics. So obviously these are all based on a, you know, not quite final design. So there's a lot more information that we wanna to put together to share with you to help make sure that all of this makes sense. And of course, we've been working very closely with our commission for persons with disabilities um, to make sure that we are designing to their needs and standards, um, as well as the MBTA, which has their own accessibility team. Um, so I think we are, we can, um, pause for questions before we do sort of a recap of where we are with the Cummins Highway project. Um, so Hannah, do you wanna just move this back um, to the slide where we have the proposed bus stop locations? Um, and then if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand um, and we can sort of skim through the chat for any um, questions that have come in. So um, Fatima asks if we are going to do a 3D presentation at some point. Um, that's a great idea and something that we can work on once we have more of those design details together. Um, so that the, like the 3D presentation matches sort of what we're actually gonna be designing for. Again, as I said, these graphics are based on you know, early design and doesn't include all of the elements that we're gonna have. Um, uh, Herman points out that some people on bikes don't use the bike lanes, they use the sidewalks a lot. Um, and that is definitely true. Um, in the city of Boston, people are, um, allowed to ride their bikes on sidewalks where they don't feel safe riding in the street. Um, but as a city, we really encourage people to ride in the street, especially if we do provide bike facilities. Um, the bike lanes that we're planning for Cummins Highway are fully separated from traffic. So they'll be really comfortable for people um, of all ages um, and abilities, uh, whether they're super comfortable riding a bike or they're still new at it to be able to um, use these lanes instead. 
Um, we also will be looking at uh, whether there will be um, traffic signals that are just for bikes. Um, oftentimes in our projects, we'll include those um, to help make sure that people on bikes are stopping for pedestrians um, or progressing along the corridor in a safe place. Um, all right, and then are there parking spaces? Yes, um, there are a lot of parking spaces along the corridor and we're actually gonna gain a few more with this project. Um, where there used to be a bus stop, um, we can use those for parking or we can use for other things. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you wanna take this question about how many, um, how much federal money or taxpayer money um, the city and state is getting for this project. Yes, I'll jump in. Um, in regards to any federal money for this project, we, we have not applied for any um, funding from the, from the state or from the federal government. I mean, this is all pretty much city capital. Um, that may change in the future, but as of right now, we're, we're the city is actually paying for this. This is a, an investment that is coming from the city of Boston. Um, and as, as, as I've kind of mentioned in some of our um, other meetings, I mean, the Mattapan community, I mean, definitely has been divested in the past. Um, so I mean, this project is, is us trying to um, provide I mean, some equitable improvements um, some well needed improvements um, to, to the city of, um, to the neighborhood of Mattapan. Um, and this, this budget has, has, has definitely blown, blown up a balloon uh, for what we initially started for this project. Um, a lot of bells and whistles that we're trying to include uh, for the Mattapan community. And, and we want to hear from you. Um, the, the, we're trying to put out the best project we can. Um, we're, we're trying to help um, improve the lives of this neighborhood. Um, and in regards to transportation and making this roadway safer, um, for not just for, for cars, but pedestrians and cyclists. Um, so yeah, we, we, we wanna hear what you have to say. Um, but yeah, as of right now, all, all city funds um, and, and it doesn't look like it's gonna be changing, <laughs> but <laughs> we'll, we'll see, we'll see. Um, Kirsty, I think there's a question here for you if you're ready to go. Um, Kay oh, is asking, how do we stop people from parking in bus stops? It's a great question, Kay. Um, so we have a, a couple of strategies, which I'll admit, none of which are perfect, um, but the Boston Transportation Department does have an excellent um, enforcement team with people who go out uh, throughout the city at almost all times of day um, and are checking for things like people stopping in bus stops. Um, those personnel are not police officers, they're civilians. And so as long as the person is parked and not moving, they're able to issue tickets to people. Um, and even if someone is stopped there, it's up to their judgment, but they could ask someone to you know, move along. Um, we also partner with the transit police um, on making sure that people don't park in bus stops. So we have a number of different personnel that kind of help us with this issue. Yeah, and so um, definitely uh, it's an issue that you know, continues to happen in the city. I think what we're trying to do with the reconstruction project is make it one very obvious where the bus stops are. Um, sometimes uh, it's not quite <laughs> clear where the bus stop is because it's not clearly painted um, or the signs are kind of old. So we wanna make sure first and foremost that that makes sense. Another reason a lot of people park in bus stops is because we didn't do as good of a job in managing um, access to the curb. So sometimes you'll see in business districts, especially where we don't have meters, that folks are um, sort of pulling into the bus stop because there's just not enough parking on the corridor. Um, so we are taking that into account with this project too. Um, and that's something that we'll continue working on through the design is just making sure that there's enough different types of um, curbside access to meet the needs of the um, the immediate businesses and homes. Um, you know, we can't promise that people are not going to do the wrong thing. Um, that is kind of part of living in a city with a lot of other people, um, but we can do our best through design to try to inform how to use the corridor in the best way. Um, all right, so we have another question that um, I'm gonna throw to you, Jeff, which is, um, how 
uh, we're thinking about traffic and uh, buses and buses sort of blocking traffic, um, especially not just MBTA buses, but also um, school buses. Yes, thank you. Um, so yes, in, 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 regards to, in regards to the traffic, um, I mean, that was mainly the, the intent of the, the pilot that we had for the past, um, I believe, year and a half. Um, we, we do know in, in regards to um, traffic functioning efficiently with one lane in each direction that it does work. Um, with the pilot, we did see that there were some issues um, where, when it came to trash trucks, when it came to um, emergency vehicles not being able to pass. Um, that's something that we did learn from um, the pilot, um, which is one of the reasons why um, for the final design, um, the preferred design, we're, we're looking at removing the median. Um, to allow cars to be able to pass. Um, I mean, whether it's uh, be cars being able to pull over so that emergency vehicle can get through, if, if trash trucks to be able to pull over or even not pull over, cars being able to pass. I mean, those are all things that we were looking at. Um, in regards to um, at each, inter each intersection, uh, we're looking at providing left turn lanes um, to provide cars to kind of go around. Um, any vehicles turning left onto the side street. So I mean, those are all the things that we're looking at um, as part of this, as part of this project, I mean, we understand that reducing the lanes from from four to two um, would 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 look it would seem like it would it would cause um, traffic congestion along the corridor. Um, but I mean, if it's done if it's done correctly, um, we can help traffic to flow efficiently. Um, we can keep people safe. Um, in terms of walking down the street, walking across the street, we can keep cyclists safe, um, which is something that we want to do on, along this corridor as well, because this is definitely a great connection for for cyclists. And what we've seen. Um, with people being able to, to travel from, you know, whether it be the Franklin, Franklin Park to the, the Ponds River, um, Ponds River Trail. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's what we've looked at and, and tried to assess during the pilot um, to help show that, to make sure that traffic, traffic um, flows efficiently. So that's something that we are looking at. We are working with the, the, um, the MBTA as well as the, um, the, the BPS in regards to the school buses. So these are all things that we, we want to hear. We, 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 are, we are analyzing as part of our design um, and we're working to make sure that we resolve those issues um, before we put a shovel into the ground. Um, on that, I will just add, uh, you know, we, we want traffic to flow, but we don't want people to be speeding. Um, and Cummins Highway is one of our highest crash corridors in the city um, that are causing injuries, whether it's to people who are in cars or people who are walking, trying to cross the street. Um, so we do want people, the traffic to continue to move, but you know, at a pace that's closer to our speed limit, which is 25 miles an hour. Um, all right. Uh, have a question. Um, why are we talking about it as the next, <laughs> Um, 70 years of Cummins Highway. Um, I can take that quickly. Um, it's because that's kind of how long we expect a street to last. Um, that's how long it has been since we last redesigned Cummins Highway. Um, so we're really trying to think about not just what we need to accommodate for today, um, but what's coming in the future. And so some of our other meetings, we've talked about heat resiliency um, and what's gonna happen in this area as a result of climate change. We've talked about air quality, um, about public health and community health. Um, and those are all sort of long-term goals um, that every project that the city does has to help influence for the better. Um, so that's why we're thinking, you know, what is this going to be for the next 70 years? Um, maybe another question for Kirsty. Um, do we have uh, heated bus shelters? Um, is that something that we would be considering? And um, uh, is that a potential for um, Cummins Highway? Um, can anyone she hear Kirsty? <laughs> yeah, she might be muted. Okay. I could jump in too. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks, Rob. <laughs> sure. Um, so everyone, my name is Robert Guptill. I'm the Director of Service Planning at the MBTA. We do have a shelter contract and one of the um, amenities that you can add to shelters are heaters. 
So obviously, you know, it increases the cost, but we will certainly look to provide the best shelters in concert with the city of Boston and what the budget can afford. And um, yeah, hopefully we can get the best products out there for people. Um, another quick question for you, Jeff. Um, if the median is removed, does that mean the streetlights are being moved to the sidewalks? Yes. Um, short answer, yes. Um, we're looking at proposing um, the, the boulevard style um, lights on Cummins Highway. Um, we plan on providing um, dual arms, which provide lights for the roadway, as well as um, shorter lights on a different height um, for pedestrians and for cyclists. Um, so yes, we, we, we are planning on moving um, the lights and providing, as, as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're pulling out all the, all the stops and trying to provide all the bells and whistles um, as part of this project. Um, so there will be um, new, um, nicer looking lights along the corridor. Um, maybe another one for you, Jeff, and something that I don't know if you have an answer to yet, but will there be consideration given to art, public art, um, along the curbs, sidewalks that's accessible to the public? Um, yes, um, great question. I actually uh, sat down with our Arts Commission um, maybe a week or two ago, um, and I did reach out to them and ask them, um, would they be interested or I mean, would, it, would there be opportunities to provide some type of art on Cummins Highway? I don't know what it will be. Um, I don't know where it will be, um, but they, this is something that they definitely said that they were interested in. Um, and I imagine I mean, they have their process where they'll, they'll reach out and, and connect with the neighborhood um, and the community to figure out um, who would be able, who would be the artist, um, as well as where they, like lo selecting locations and where they can be. Um, as part of this project, we are looking at um, proposing the, the, the roundabout at the Greenfield Road, um, Boy Bossett, Alabama, Cummins Highway intersection. Um, so, I mean, that's this potential um, for some type of art there as well, um, just as long as it doesn't affect, I mean, site distances and traffic safety. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's definitely opportunity for it um, and, and we're happy to see, um, I'm happy to continue working with um, the Arts Commission as well as um, the community to see what we can come up with. Um, yeah, and I think, uh, you know, we are in coordination with other projects like Blue Hill Ave and the Arts Commission to make sure that, you know, our approach to arts in street spaces um, in Mattapan, you know, makes sense for the community and whether that is continuing with whatever we're thinking about for Blue Hill Ave up Cummins Highway or it's something a little bit different. I think we have a lot of room and space to think about that. Um, uh, all right, so um, how do we determine the length and width of sidewalks on Cummins Highway? I'm gonna throw that to you too, Jeff. Um, honestly, it's, it's, it's in regards to the width of the roadway. I mean, what, what we can fit um, in, in terms of, 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 of any roadway, you I mean Cummins Highway, for example. I mean, there's a there's a lot of competing um, interests in regards to vehicles, cyclists, pedestrians. Um, our intent is to provide the most space um, to provide safety for each of our each mode of transportation. Um, with Cummins Highway, um, reducing the number of travel lanes from four to two I mean, it frees up a, a, a lot of space, which is why we, which is why we've looked at proposing I mean the, the bicycle lanes along this corridor. Um, we're also able to allocate some of that space um, to pedestrians as well, which is why we're looking at um, increasing the sidewalks, I believe, from nine to 12 feet. Um, so I mean, it, it's, it's more of the existing conditions of the roadway. I mean, what's, what space is available um, and then allocating uh, whatever space is needed through each, through each mode of transportation, whether it be the, the travel, travel lanes, um, bicycle lanes, as well as pedestrians. So it, it's about just balancing um, um, those dimensions. Um, there are also a couple of questions here about crosswalk murals and 3D crosswalks. So um, we don't do the you know 3D crosswalk thing um, in Boston, and, and most communities don't because um, it could actually cause more crashes if people are 
not expecting it and think there are actually blocks in the roadway. Um, the other side of it is that if you've seen it a few times, like you already know it's there and you know it's not real. Um, so it doesn't have a long-term impact. Um, this is why we're designing raised crosswalks um, and other safe crossing opportunities um, that are sort of permanently built um, so that we're um, not relying on sort of tricking people. Um, as far as murals for the crosswalks, um, that's definitely something we can talk about. It does have a maintenance implication to it. And um, there are quite a few aspects on this project where we're looking at um, other ways to understand the maintenance needs um, with the community. So um, as I mentioned, we're looking at planting street trees. We've talked about green infrastructure. We're gonna have these bus shelters and e-ink signs. So there's quite a lot of sort of new things that we're already thinking about. Um, so we can add another one to the list, but no promises yet on, on whether we're able to. Um, all right, we have a raised hand, um, Christina J. There okay. we go. I think I think it's working now. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, I don't think my question was actually addressed. My previous one before the three D sidewalk um, question. I do really appreciate this this you know redesigning of Cummins Highway. I think making the bike lanes a completely separate lane is a great idea. Um, however, it as with all change, it does take some time. And, you know, I can only see that, you know, the reason for in, an increase in accidents and, you know, people getting injured is because people want to get through, literally speed through Cummins Highway to get to where they want to go, right? It's, it's, it's a street that leads to the highway, to other parts of Boston. And I'm just seriously thinking about how, um, how we can educate the community. And I'm wondering what, what groups you're working with um, to educate the community. I think people living all along Cummins Highway understand that, you know, you need to be slower, do you need to watch out for people, but just in general, like, do you have plans to have some sort of, I don't know, people ticketing um, officers, temporary officers place to like ticket people who are speeding or like doing illegal, driving or something like that, or crossing guards to really help manage the flow of traffic. I'm just wondering what that effort looks like. Um, uh, yeah, I, well, okay, I, I'll take some of it and then I'll let Jeff add. Um, so obviously there's culture change with any change, like with anything in the city. And I think um, knowing that uh, people are unfamiliar with some of the designs that we put out there. Um, we do have materials and um, like we have videos about um, separated bike lanes, how to park with them. Um, we have handouts uh, for cyclists about the rules and um, regulations that they need to um, comply by. Um, we have in the past sent um, mailers within the excise tax. Uh, so everyone who has a car um, gets information about safe driving. And these are things that we can continue to do. Um, we also post educational signs, we share flyers, um, and we have classes. So it is a long-term effort um, to sort of change how people interact um, with streets. Um, but we know that through design, we have a really strong tool and one that is actually studied to be one of the most effective tools in changing the way people behave on the streets is changing the way that they're built. Um, so Jeff, do you wanna talk a little bit about some of the design features that we're gonna to use to try to encourage people to behave appropriately, knowing that some people are still gonna do what they want? Yes, um, I mean, and, and the thing is, is, um, in regards to errant behaviors or errant drivers, um, I mean, it's something that we kind of have to kind of deal with. I mean, people, pe there are people who just don't care. Um, 
and I, I, as part of this project, we we have worked with the um, the BPD um, in order to try to not necessarily enforce um, the pilot that we proposed on Cummins Highway, but to try to curb errant behaviors. Um, there was a number of uh, there was a couple of officers that I worked with from um, B three as well as E eighteen. Um, just to have them on site, not to ticket anyone, but just to remind people not to park in the, in the bike lanes and to, to drive safely. Um, and based on the conversations I've had with them, um, because I mean, from working with Public Works, we didn't want police out there enforcing our pilot. You mean, because to us, I mean, that, that seems like a, a trap. We're, we're setting up the road to, to ticket people, or whatever the case may be. So we didn't want to do that. Uh, but in, in my conversations with the officers, they were saying that people just didn't care. Like there were some drivers who would see the cop car um, and because they're not out there pulling people over, like they would still speed by and, and pull off. Um, so in, in terms of enforcement, I mean, unfortunately, the, the city of Boston doesn't have traffic police. Um, so they mean you can, as a resident, you, you can definitely call the police and tell them that, I mean, that people are speeding on your roadway and you want to, to, for them to enforce um, I mean, this section of the roadway, I mean, they'll, they'll be out there for a week um, and then they're gone after that and, and the errant behaviors kind of continue. Um, so what we find is that, I mean, the best way to try, try to curb errant behaviors is to, um, to change the, the design of the roadway, to change the geometry. So whether that be mean providing bump outs, um, narrowing, um, narrowing the travel lanes, um, providing vertical elements, what we, what we find is that I mean, if you're driving down a roadway and, and for example, you mean a, a regular city residential roadway, you I mean, if there's parking on both sides, um, when you're driving 40 miles an hour, you I mean, down a, a 40 foot roadway with parking on both sides, I mean, you, you're going to feel it. You feel like it's, you're going to feel like you're driving too fast. Um, some people just don't care. <laughs> um, even if, you know I mean, so it, it's, it's more of just trying to provide um, geometry changes, um, raise elements. I mean, with, 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 what we plan on doing that for Cummins Highway on, on the approaches, which is, I mean, raise crosswalks on the side, um, on the side street so that when people are entering the Cummins Highway, they have to kind of slow down into Cummins Highway and slow down out of Cummins Highway. Um, but then also, I mean, with, with parking on, on both sides, street trees, um, I mean, removal of the median, uh, we, we, we find that people do drive slower. Um, and 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 we, I mean, ultimately, it's it's more of um, in, in terms of traffic and, and people's behaviors. I mean, it's 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 ultimately a, a culture shift. People need to change the way they um, where they where they travel throughout the city. Um, people need to change. I mean, this, the city, there the, the speed limit. I mean, throughout the city is twenty five miles per hour. Um, and it, it's I what we notice in that people have been driving slower along Cummins Highway through through the pilot. Um, I mean, we we that that data is available on the website so that, I mean, reducing the number of travel lanes um, and providing these these the the, the um, I'm sorry, the um, flex poles at, at the intersections to kind of help um, navigate um, well oh actually um, 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 direct vehicles with a with a drive along the corridor. I mean, it did help slow vehicles down. Um, so we do know that reducing the number of travel lanes along this corridor does help slow vehicles down. Um, but I mean, it's 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 something that that's that's going to be an issue until people change their behaviors, unfortunately. Um, but we we could we could try our best in terms of the engineering aspect of it to help um, to help make it safer. I know mean, it was long-winded. I'm sorry about that, but <laughs> it's it's a it's a complicated issue. Yeah. Um, so have another. Um, sorry, there's there are a lot of things that came in. Um, so Tatama was also asking about um, the timing of the traffic signals and things like that. Um, and John. Um, provided a response. John is one of our senior engineers in the transportation department. Um, I just want to flag that we are planning on having a meeting about um, the intersections, so traffic signals, roundabouts. Um, I'm looking to have that meeting probably in March, um, so we'll be able to go into that in a lot of detail, um, and I'm excited that the question already came up um, because this is um, 
an interesting topic to go into. So we'll definitely do that. Um, uh, let's see, there's another question about will be be monitoring and making changes determined by what we see in the results. Jeff. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? I, I was being another question. <laughs> sorry, but will <laughs> we be monitoring and making changes based on what we sort of see happening? Um, monitoring, yes. Um, making changes, um, that's still up for discussion. Um, I mean, the, the intent is to design the roadway um, and, and address a number of the issues that we've seen through the pilot. I mean, that, that was the main purpose of the pilot, to see where there are issues and make sure that those issues are resolved prior to us actually putting a, a, a shovel in the ground. Um, in terms of monitoring, yes, like there's a number of uh, metrics that we're looking at for this, for this street. Um, the city hasn't done a great job in the past um, in regards of, of metrics of projects that have already been built and, and um, studying how they work or don't work. Um, this is something that we are trying to do now. This is something that we are learning and trying to move forward because um, ultimately, I mean, you, you wanna learn from your past mistakes and kind of move forward. Um, move forward better um, to provide safety throughout these to, with these projects. I mean, so, I mean, yes, but we are going to be monitoring and looking at it um, in terms of changes. Um, we, I mean, we're, we, we make changes with, with projects all the time in terms of I mean, traffic signals. If we see something that needs to be um, adjusted, um, we're happy to go out there and make the changes. Um, geometrical changes is a little bit more difficult, but, um, but yeah, if there's something that is a blatant issue, that needs to be um, corrected, then yes, I mean, we, 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 would, we would go in there and make changes. So, um, um, okay, I, so um, there have been continued conversations in the chat and questions about enforcement. Um, so since it's coming up again, Karsti um, on the transit team was gonna add a bit more, um, so. Yes, um, so we know enforcement is a problem and we know that it's not, um, especially around bus stops, it's not something we're necessarily doing well today. And um, so I wanna start by acknowledging that we are working on it. So like Stephanie and Jeff mentioned, even with just how the street is going to be designed, we're hoping that with more parking spaces, with clear bus stops and such, that um, it'll at least be more obvious to people where the bus stops are and um, for sort of those individuals who are, um, you know, just taking advantage of parking in the bus stop because they're running late, but they need the opportunity. We're hoping that those design changes will kind of help to discourage that behavior. Um, but we know that's not enough. So there are a couple of things. Um, Rob Guptel, who's also on this call, we often work with him and his uh, colleagues at MBTA to have targeted enforcement um, right when a project is launched. So for instance, with our bus lane project, but it's also something that we would look into here is that once the reconstruction is done, we would have transit police and um, our enforcement officers come by more frequently to make sure that people are not parking in the bus stops or standing in the bus stops to try to discourage that behavior from the outset. Um, more broadly though, in terms of long-term changes, we are at the city working on um, an enforcement, bus lane and bus stop enforcement strategy for the city. Um, and so we will likely need support from the state legislature for a lot of that. Um, but it's something that we're, we're thinking about. We know we're not doing as well as we need to today. Um, and I'm happy to put my email in the chat if you have thoughts, contributions you want to make um, on this topic, or if you want to engage further on it, I'm always available. Uh, Rob, did you have anything else that you want to add on that? No, just that I guess well, one thing you mentioned working with the state legislator as the legislature. Uh, right now, we are prohibited from state law of recording, um, putting cameras on buses and recording uh, cars that are parked in a bus stop. But the MBTA and MassDOT is actually working. And this would be, I, I think, what Christy is mentioning 
uh, working with the state legislature to see if we could actually change the law to put cameras on buses to allow buses to film cars that are parked in bus lanes or bus stops such that um, we can actually find those uh, stopped vehicles. Um, Kenya, you've had your hand up. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I think Kirsty had, I think she might have already um, answered the question, but I just wanted to reiterate uh, folks' uh, concerns around people parking in the bus lanes because it's an ongoing thing, I think, across the city, uh, but specifically in Mattapan, especially the intersection at Morton and Blue Hill and definitely on Blue Hill Avenue, like near Talbot, Talbot Ave as you're approaching Franklin Park. It's an ongoing issue. And so then cars are then forced to double park and triple park in the middle of the street, which sometimes then narrows the two lane to one lane that caused that that's an ongoing issue. So I think Kirsty already answered that, but I just kind of want to reiterate that it's, I think it's a city issue, but I know it's definitely a problem in Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan, and I'm sure other, other spots and other neighborhoods within the city. So that's the only thing I wanted to say. Thank you. Thanks, Kenya. Um, there are also a number of questions that are in the chat about, you know, the volume of traffic and is it going to work on this corridor? Um, and I think Again, we're, we're continuing to have conversations. The meeting in March will really dig into some of the traffic pieces, but we are um, anticipating uh, actual growth in vehicle numbers as part of our design for this. Um, so what really impacts the ability of um, the flow of traffic are traffic signals. And so wherever we can optimize those um, or uh, you know, build a roundabout instead that helps people keep moving and reduces that congestion. Um, there's also a separate project um, with another meeting that we'll tell you about for Mattapan Square and thinking about how those traffic signals work um, and the Cummins Highway project and that project have been in close coordination um, so that uh, hopefully we see benefits along Cummins Highway as part of that effort. Um, Okay, uh, let's, um, Kenya, you put your hand back up, I think. Um. <laughs> I'll take it down, my bad, okay. sorry. That's okay, I just wasn't quite sure if you had something else to add. Otherwise, we'll go to um, Fatima. Hi, uh, thank you, thank you for the presentation, great job. Um, Quick question. So about two weeks ago, there was a horrific accident, not accident, I'm sorry, crashes, a series of crashes that happened at Morton and Blue Hill when the lights went out on Saturday right at 8 p.m. and lasted, were out continuously until noon the next following day. Um, they were so bad, cars went into buildings and took out traffic signals. There was absolutely no light. My question is, um, lights go out. Is there any going to be any, knowing this, is there going to be, or um, what is the planned effort to um, immediately react to those kind of things? Um, especially on roads like when you come to the lights of Harvard Street and Cummins on a Saturday evening, um, or American Legion in Cummins, or River Street in Cummins. It's, um, you know, it, without lighting, it just becomes more dangerous. So we know that this happens. Um, we've all probably seen quite terrible crashes happen when, light, when traffic lights go out or when the physical street lights go out as well. How can that be addressed? Um, Fatima, I just have a question for you. So I just want to clarify that you're talking about the, um, the safety concerns or, or the chaos that was happening because of the traffic signals right. going out, not the street well, lights themselves along. They, the they, they both went out in port at the same time. Okay. Oh, so that means there's obviously some type of widespread electricity, you know, some, some type of, uh, right. But what I, my, my question, right. But my question is it's still a street. There were still cars are going to be on the road and fast. it went yeah. out where things where people were moving in the street as well as vehicles. What is going to be our, our, now that we know this, we're aware of it, what are we going to, what's the plan? Gotcha. So, going, you know, we have to do something. We can't yeah, be reactive. 
Yeah, no, understood. Um, so I think, so some of the locations that you mentioned, um, I think are under, or I'm, I'm almost positive are under state jurisdiction. Um, a lot of Morton Street is still somehow considered a state road for DCR. Um, and so there's, there are some interesting overlaps on, on who would be responding and who is the first person to get the phone call. Um, in the case where the whole power goes out like that in an area, there are a lot of phone calls that start to get, um, <laughs> that start to ring. Um, of course, nothing happens fast enough because as soon as the lights go out, someone crashes into something. And as you said, you know, you, uh, you witnessed a whole lot of them. Um, the battery backups, yeah. So uh, the city intersections, um, which are a handful of them on Cummins, High, uh, Cummins Highway out here, are city locations because it's a city street properly. Um, there are backups in the traffic signals. Um, so that's why sometimes you'll see two of those big steel boxes side by side. Um, some of those will have those backup uh, batteries. We are working with some of the partners with the state on things like Blue Hill and Morton, just because it's a it's an enormous intersection or it's a very uh, active crossing. Um, to try and improve some of those safety things, they're on just a different timeline and track for things like upgrading and you know even revisiting it, even saying you know we're going to do counts at it and looking at where people are turning and moving and crossing now as opposed to three or four years ago. So they're just on a different, um, it's just a different program. And, and we are trying to kind of coordinate that a little bit better because as a constituent, you know, as a community, there is no difference between Blue Hill and Morton and, you know, Blue Hill and American Legion or something like that. It, it doesn't feel any different because it doesn't look any different. So we are trying to work with them a little bit better, but the city streets and the city um, signals on Cummins Highway, they do have, they, or they will have those battery backups. Thanks, John. Okay, so we'll, we'll, don't worry, we'll, we'll hold you to it. Um, all Thank right, you. so I'm um, gonna, uh, one last question before we start sort of wrapping things up. So, um, oh, we just got another question coming. Okay, so Tiffany. Hi, I was just wondering, where can I find a picture of the final project for Cummins Highway? I thought that I had clicked on the link that would take me to it earlier because while everyone's speaking about the renovations, I'm the type of person I, I need to see it. Like I can try to picture it in my head, but it works better for me if I see it. Is there a website or uh, something that I can go to and view the final project? Um, so we don't actually have a final design yet. We do have some concept drawings. Um, they are on the website, but they're probably hidden. Um, mm -hmm. Like there's just a lot of stuff on the website, mm -hmm. um, but we can uh, make sure to send them or send them to you via email. Or maybe if Jen is extremely um, amazing, she'll find them <laughs> and uh, send a link directly to them in the chat um, before we wrap up today. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Look That'd for that in the chat, and if not, we'll um, be sure to send you a follow-up email. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Of course. All right. Now, the real last question. Um, uh, Helena? Yes, just quickly. I mentioned this in a previous meeting, and I just want to see if there's any updates. And I know um, there's been quite a few meetings of, on, about Cummins Highway and various topics. And um, there was another meeting in regards to these bus stops. And one of the things that I had asked is, is, is there conversations happening at the state level about reliable transportation? Because it's great to make all of these great changes. And I say this more specifically as in two weeks ago, I picked up um, a parent and her daughter that were freezing and they looked like they were going to the match school. And I turned around and picked them up and they said, the bus never came. And there was a little girl and her daughter heading to the match school. So I say that with emphasis is, you know, this may all look good and we've got benches and lighting and new stops and raised sidewalks and ADA compliance and, and a partridge and a pear tree. But if there's no bus, you know, it's all you know, a moot point. So I really want to make sure there's those cross conversations that are happening, or I, to better put, uh, to better state it, what updates do you have from the last time that I made this, you know? This yeah, absolutely. So um, that's one of the reasons why Kirsty from the transit team and Rob from the T are here. Um, Kirsty, Rob, do you want to um, chime in with some of the work that the MBTA has been doing on 
uh, bus reliability, bus scheduling, um, making the bus better for everyone who's riding. Sure, I can. Yeah. I can speak. Go ahead, Rob. Okay, Go Christy, ahead. feel free to add. But yes, um, good. It's certainly, you know, we're, we're having a, a severe driver shortage right now, and that's certainly contributing to a lot of what we call drop trips and these instances of people, you know, just not seeing buses come out and. Hopefully, as the pandemic uh, starts to wane and people's health improves, and we get uh, more operators that can consistently, you know, take their their, their trips and, and, and their shifts and everything, uh, we will be able to uh, operate the schedule that we say that we can. And um, you know, we're certainly looking to hire more operators right now. So. I certainly encourage anyone that knows anyone that's interested in becoming an MBTA operator to apply. I think this is a great time with a lot of excitement right now. I would also mention that we are currently involved in what is called the bus network redesign process. And Jen had posted a link to that, um, that site, the website for that. Um, it's uh, an opportunity to really rethink the bus network, to think about what makes good service, um, in terms of the routes, in terms of the frequencies, in terms of the connections, pretty much anything. And projects like these are certainly what we're thinking of when we're thinking about the infrastructure that needs to go in to provide better bus service. But you're very right that service is the most important thing that comes in and how frequently, how frequently that bus is operating is key to providing a sense of reliability so that people can, can depend on public transportation. So I encourage people to be involved in our bus network redesign process. We should be coming out with a draft map for this process in the spring, so not too far away. And uh, that's an opportunity to uh, think about the draft ideas that we have, give us your own ideas. And uh, we're certainly excited to work with you to try and improve bus service overall. All right, Jen. Oh, sorry, Chrissy. I'm just, uh, Jen, I know I asked you to, to find a, <laughs> pictures to link, but if you can also um, put the bus network redesign link back in the chat um, so people can find it again. Um, thank yeah. you. And Kirsty, on to you. Yeah, I just, basically everything Rob said, um, you know, we're always interested in hearing about your perceptions about service and everything as well. So um, I shared my personal email. I'll also share the BTD transit program email. Um, we check that very regularly, but we um, at the city are very invested in and advocating for increased money for service and operations so that we can have a better bus system for everybody who uses it. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Um, all right, I know I have a couple more hands raised, but um, I do want to just try to get through the last bit of the presentation and then we can come back to um, discussion. So Hannah, you want to take us through those last, there we go. All right, um, sorry about that. So really briefly, um, we're just going to just gonna recap on what's next for the project. So overall, the goal for the reconstruction is to transform Cummins Highway into a tree-lined neighborhood street that is safer for families to walk, wait for the bus, ride bikes, or travel by vehicle. It will connect residents to the city's network of open spaces and make it easier for all people, um, including elders, to cross the street. So where we are is, um, we had a series of meetings in 2019 to um, early 2020, and then um, what followed was a trial um, testing the temporary design. Um, and now we are holding topic focused converse virtual conversations every month um, to talk about specific aspects of the new um, design for the reconstruction. And so some of the focused conversations we began with a 
Tea Talk with our community partners with Mattapan Food and Fitness and Powerful Pathways. Um, in June 2021, we hosted a special edition Tea Talk with Charles T. Brown to discuss ways mobility of Black Americans is limited in the, in the US through police policies and politics. Um, and then my colleague Jen is just going to post the links to all of the previous um, presentations, which we have video recordings of. Um, and then in July 2021, we held a meeting with the Environment Department. We talked about heat resilience um, and how the new redesign can consider ways to mitigate um, the impacts of heat um, and climate change. We also talked about air quality and how transportation policies, policies and street design influence um, air quality in a neighborhood. In August, we hosted a virtual meeting with the BPDA and we talked about transportation and land use and how our two departments collaborate. In um, September, we hosted a meeting about sh um, street lighting with our street lighting division in the city. And we talked about um, the goals, how, how the reconstruction can change and improve lighting along the corridor. In October, we talked about um, health, sh how street design health and well being are connected with um, Mary Bovenzi from the Boston Public Health Commission. And then we're going to continue these conversations every month over the next year. So our next one is on February, February 23rd. And we're going to focus again on street trees. So um, please sign up and register for that meeting. Um, you'll find the registration link in the chat shortly. Um, and then we're going to continue to talk about some other design specific aspects, um, including roundabouts and intersections um, and street design, how we can, through street design, we can improve. Um, the mobility for people with disabilities and more. So stay tuned. And then as always, if you still have questions and wanna to talk to us, you can sign up for a 15 minute phone call or virtual meeting um, every Wednesday. You can follow our website. Um, please sign up for the email list to, hear, to get in, um, email reminders about these meetings and the progress of the project. And if you, want to send an email to Jeff, the project manager for this project. Um, we'll share uh, his email address in the chat. Okay, um, so before I go to this, um, that so this concludes our contact specifically about Cummins Highway. Um, I think we're gonna go back to just a couple more questions. Oh, Hannah, actually, can you just um, finish this section? Oh yeah, sure. We'll, yeah, thanks. Okay, so in all of these meetings, we always share a little bit about other resources in the city um, that are available to residents. So the Route 28 bus will continue to be free um, until February 28, 2022. And you can find more information about that on the website. We're also um, collaborating on a redesign of Mattapan Square. Uh, there's a public meeting for that on February 15th, 6.30. So please join us to where we talk about this related project. Um, and save the date for the next tea talk with Mattapan Food and Fitness. Um, this will be a youth focused tea talk on Saturday, Saturday February 26th. And we'll focus on Blue Hill Avenue as a place. Um, there's also Blue Hill Ave Town Hall, um, co-sponsored by Councillor Julia Mejia, Mejia and Notorious. And then, um, so our Blue Bikes system is a is our public bike share system, and. Uh, we have a discounted pass for anyone who participates in a public assistance program. 
and the discount discount passes are fifty dollars a year or five dollars a month. Um, the city of Boston is also dedicating federal funds to help Boston residents who have been economically impacted by COVID-19. So if you would like more information um, about rental relief, we have more information at boston.gov slash rental dash relief. And then um, on December 15, 2021, the Public Facilities Commission voted to designate DVM Consulting um, and Habitat for Humanity um, of Boston for eight of the 10 parcels included in the Blue Hill Ave Action Plan. So if you wanna read more about that, we'll sh we're sharing that in the link that in the chat. Um, the Walk of Playground is going to open again, reopen. Um, so this is just a um, announcement from the Boston Parks and Rec Commission. And then if you would like to stay in touch with us, um, our contacts for transit planning and bus stops um, is Christy Hostetter, and she shared your information with you all. And so if you have more questions, please reach out to her. And as always, you can reach out to us about anything else related to the Cummins Highway redesign. All right, so I think that's what we have for now. Um, we're gonna stay on here for a little bit longer. So if you would like to ask us more questions, but otherwise, thank you everyone for joining tonight. Um, one more <laughs> resource before folks drop off. Um, so there is actually another tea talk that is going to be on February 9th, um, focused on food and transportation. Um, Chevelle put the link in the chat, um, but I will put it in there one more time. Um, if you're interested, it's um, bit.ly slash t dash talks seven. Um, so please be sure to join that to learn more about food and transportation and how they overlap. Okay, um, for those who um, still have questions or wanna stay, um, we'll continue the conversation like Hannah said. So Michelle, Jay, you have been waiting eagerly. Um, so you're up. Michelle, you will need to unmute yourself. You should be able to. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Yeah. Okay, so the question is with, all, with the traffic changes, how can we, um, as just, you know, users of the road, if we see problems, um, how can we get them addressed? Um, like what uh, would trigger, for instance, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm scared of the road divider on Cummings Highway going away. Because, I mean, if people are doing the speed limit, which is 25, 30 miles an hour, and they hit, that's a 60 mile, 50, 60 mile an hour crash. Again, how can that be addressed? Road slippery, has snow on the road? I don't know. But without that lane divider, I'm concerned. And how could that be addressed? What would trigger it to say, hey, something has to change? That's my question. Sure. Um, so the the median um, can be helpful in some situations to help address um, the potential crash, like head on crashes. Um, but for Cummins Highway, um, you know, we're working really hard to make sure that um, it will be safe, even, um, and a median isn't necessary in most situations. Um, but Jeff is leading the design, so I really should be um, looking to him to answer this question. <laughs> yes, oh, thank you for your question. Um, so 
in regards to the medium, like I, I understand your concern um, with the, the speeding that we currently see on Cummins Highway. Um, as of right now, it's, it's a four lane roadway um, divided by a median. Um, the median definitely um, encourages, encourages might be the wrong word, but I mean, allows people to kind of pick up more speed and feel safer to drive at those kind of speeds, especially because what we look at Cummins Highway, the, the, the amount of vehicles that currently drive or number of drivers, the, the, car, the car, the volume of cars on this roadway um, doesn't really, um, um, doesn't really match with what the capacity of the street actually provides or allows, um, which is why we're seeing cars that are driving 40, 50 miles per hour on this roadway. Um, with the two lane roadway, I mean, because of the geometry of the roadway, because you, you, you don't have a median, you're, you're, you're gonna have to drive slower. Um, it, it, it just, as I mentioned, I mean, if you're driving down a roadway, uh, a, a narrow roadway with two cars on the side, I mean, it's going to feel like you're driving faster than you actually are. Um, roadways that, two lane roadways don't generally need a median. Medians are usually provided for roadways that have three or four more travel lanes, um, especially if, if they go going in opposite directions. Um, with Cummins Highway reducing it from, from four to two, um, there's a number of streets throughout the city of Boston where um, we see, I mean, cars driving um, River Street, for example. I mean, River Street is a, is a, is a two lane roadway, cars driving in each direction uh, without a median. This is, this is something that we, we see throughout the city of Boston. Um, um, I, as I mentioned, like, I understand your concern, but we're, we're also looking at other ways of not only, not just removing the median and reducing the number of travel lanes, but we're also looking at other ways to, to make the roadway safer, to, to make people drive um, a lot slower along the corridor. So um, I mean, it's something that we are looking at, I understand your concern, um, and, and that's something that we are definitely um, analyzing and looking at as part of this design. Right, um, again, River Street is not coming highway. And you, there was an opportunity uh, when the um, the the bicycle lane was on the right curb, right, and then you had that parking area for cars, um, and you had the flexi sticks, and um, and it was reduced essentially to one lane. And yes, at first people did slow down because they had one lane per direction. But eventually people got used to it and the speeds did pick up. And um, again, I'm, I'm just concerned. That's all I'm saying. Here. Yeah. I mean, now, uh, as, as people get used to something, and the difference between River Street and American Legion is River Street's a windy road. But if, you know, there, there are curves in there. America, uh, Cummings Highway from essentially the bridge, uh, the train bridge, I don't know the name of the street where it starts, all the way up to Wood Ave, it's essentially a straight, non-winding road. Yeah. So look, I just hope it works out. And yeah, I mean, all I'm wondering is from a, 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 someone who lives in the community, someone who drives on the street, what would trigger a relook? That's all I want to know. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I thank thank you for your comment. I mean, like, as I mentioned, like, we're, we're looking at Cummins Highway. We're looking at making it the best, the safest as possible. Um, I mean, Cummins Highway. I mean, past Wood Ave down to down to um, Rosendale Square is actually one lane in each direction, no median. Um, right, we'll, and you know, at one time it was wide, and if you if you had a a, a question, you can go off towards this curb, but now the flexi sticks are there. You basically got to say, okay, I hope that road is, is plowed and sanded, or that person really can handle that, that curb, that, that, uh, the speed they're driving. But I'm not gonna, I, I'm not gonna go on. Obviously you want, want it to be as safe as possible. Again, the question is, what would trigger a rethink? That's it, that's all I'm asking. Thanks. You did answer my question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chad? 
Oh, yes. Yeah. So it was a question that I had. Yeah, I posted in the chat. Well, others, but yeah, first thing, when I clicked on the link that I believe Hannah posted, I didn't, yeah, I didn't see anywhere that I could register for the meeting on February 15th. That's just, that's just the first, but I have others. Um, yeah, I don't think that there is actually a link to the meeting yet, um, but in the chat, um, both me and Jen have provided a link to the project page where you can sign up for email updates or um, send a note to ask um, for that. Okay, okay, I got it. Okay, I have to find that. Um, but, but yeah, also, um, just thinking back on the question that I asked about how the, you know, the length and width of the sidewalks are determined. Um, have you, I mean, have you put like, I got to go into the chat because I'm trying to fit, I'm just thinking to, I'm just thinking how you may have considered, if you have considered the, 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 the length or, it, no, I, I posted it in the chat. If you can just give me one second, I'm going to, I'm going to scroll back up and, uh, and see what it was. Hang on. It was. I'm sorry. I don't want to. I don't want to hold it. Hold anyone up because I know other people want to speak. But yeah, like I was thinking about how you determine the size of the how you determine the size of the sidewalks relative to uh, walking and assistive devices. Like how does that? I mean, how does that deter? I'm just thinking. How does that, if at all, how does it determine the size of and size and the width of of the sidewalk for for coming and not even just that but the curb too so so in regards to the 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 width of the sidewalk for assistive devices, I mean like low chairs um exactly it, from, oh yeah yes so i mean ultimately we, we follow guidelines um we follow the the aa the aab the um um the architectural the, access board yeah our, yeah yeah sorry architectural access board as well as okay. um, the ADA, um, so it, it, it's more so about um, the, their clearance space that they need for wheelchairs. I believe it's it's three feet. Um, mm -hmm. Sidewalks need to be a minimum size. Um, I, city standards. I mean, we 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 definitely um, we definitely we we strive to provide more space for, for pedestrians along our sidewalks. Um, I mean, our standard is. is I mean, it's. Not, we, we, we want to have a, 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 a at the minimum of five foot um, clearance for you mean pedestrians. So whether it be wheelchairs, people walking with strollers, um, our sidewalks, we, we want them to be a minimum of eight feet. I mean, that's that's our standard that we try to maintain. Um, anything wider is is a plus. Um, so that's that's ultimately what it is. It's like we, we, we have minimums that we have to um, adhere to, um, but the city, our standards are definitely higher than that. Um, so you I mean, it's, when it comes to allocating space, the more that we could provide for whether it's pedestrians, um, for cyclists, I mean, the better. Um, cars, I mean, we, we know what they need. I mean, they need 10 feet wide lanes. Um, we try not to go anything lower than that. Um, anything wider makes it a lot more comfortable for vehicles to drive even faster. Um, so one of the things that we look at um, to try to help reduce speeds is to narrow the travel lanes. Um, but any other, like as I mentioned, the space that we have on Cummins Highway, wherever we can allocate space for pedestrians and cyclists. I mean, that's, that's essentially what we're trying to do. Um, I mean, with, with sidewalks, I mean, you know, you have, you have street lights, you have hydrants, you have I mean, mailboxes, all those things kind of get away, get in the way of, of people um, walking on the sidewalks. I mean, so we try to provide those only in the furniture zone, which is usually about two feet from the curb. Um, anything else we want to hopefully provide clearance space for for anyone else we want people to be able to walk I mean in tandem or shoulder to shoulder I mean that's that's what we want what we prefer to make it more comfortable for people walking um, curb size um, the curb we generally want the curb to be a minimum of six inches um, high we want to provide a curb reveal six inches and that's mainly um, for safety I mean to provide um, pedestrians a separation from the roadway um, and it's more so like if, if cars a a a driver is driving errantly and it hits the curb and I mean the the worst thing that can happen is a car jumps the curb and hits somebody in the hit the pedestrian that's walking on the sidewalk. We find that yeah. um, six inches is um, the the standard to kind of keep vehicles off the sidewalk. Um, and we don't want them to be too high because then I mean if, if park cars park against. A curb reveal that's nine inches, for example, which we, we, we do allow at catch basins, 
um, then cars, passengers aren't able to get out of their cars. Um, so we, we try to maintain a standard six inch reveal for the curb um, um, to provide I mean, safety for, for pedestrians along the sidewalk. Um, so that's, those are the main reasons that we look at those, those whiffs. Um, but as I mentioned, um, you could go around, you could walk around Boston and, and there's 15 foot, 20 foot, you mean sidewalks, but those are usually locations where you mean there's an, a lot of pedestrians. The volume of pedestrians is like Boston Street or something like that, and um, um, Beacon Street or something like that, Commonwealth. I mean, where you're going to see a lot of pedestrians. That's why you I mean you see those kind of um, widths. Of, of course, those streets are a lot wider as well. Um, but th those are the main reasons. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I have one. I have one more, guys. Um, yeah. So I was looking. I was looking at the. I'm looking at the earlier slides, um, where there's the highest concentration of youth, the highest concentration of people with disabilities, and the highest concentration of uh, of the elder of elderly citizens. Um, I def. I mean, that was just my rec. I mean, I, I saw. I saw the proposal as well. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I would definitely suggest, you know, having the bulk. I know, I know you kind of want all the stops to be fairly equidistant. I mean, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned there was a, a length. Um, I know you, so I know you want them all to be equidistant, but I think the bulk of the stop should, should be where, might sound obvious, but yeah, the bulk of the stop should be where, uh, where there's the, the highest population, you know what I mean, where there's the highest yeah. population. Um, actually, Hannah, can you go to the spacing slide? Um, so this, yeah, uh, keep going. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. Okay. So they're not actually equidistant. They are still kind of variable. And for the most part, we are keeping them very close to where they currently are today. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we did look at a different um, scheme for consolidation, and that felt like too far, too many bus stops removed, too difficult um, for everyone to get where they're going. So for the most part, these are slight tweaks to where the bus stops are located today to make sure that we can have the space we need for a fully accessible bus stop, that the buses are not blocking any driveways um, or side streets, and that everyone can pull over. So um, it is definitely more of an art than like, okay, we're going to make sure that they're exactly, you know, 470 feet apart or whatever, especially in a city like Boston, where we don't have a grid. If we had a grid, it would make things a little simpler. But yeah, they're mostly going to, they're mostly staying close to where they are today. Okay, still with, with respect to, uh, you know, with respect to the, you know, the high, the levels of concentration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, the... One of the reasons why we're keeping so many of them is because, um, you know, when we look at where people live in the neighborhood, um, we want to make sure that it, it's not more difficult for them to get to the bus um, yeah. than it is today. So that's one of the reasons why we're keeping so many. Okay. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Well, that well, thank you for that. I think that's pretty much all I've all I've got. But. I'm going. I'm gonna search for that link that I can get email updates. Um, I'm just trying. I'm trying to find out where it is because we have a lot in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this. No, but it's good though. It's good. I'm trying to find it here. So everyone who um, attended this meeting is going to oh, get uploaded to the newsletter to the email list. So if you or, have attended or come in. Yeah, for Cummins Highway, but he's yeah. asking about the Mattapan Square awesome. email sign up. So um, there, Jen just pasted it one more time. So it's right there at the bottom of the chat for you. All right. Thank you, Thank you Jen. Thank you. All right, guys. Ooh, cool. Okay. I'm just copying, I'm just copying and pasting these, these links down, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave it open to anyone else that might have any, that might have any other questions. Um, you should also be able to save the chat if you want. Um, so there's an icon that looks like a piece of paper that's folded and then a smiley face and then there's three dots. If you click three dots, you should be able to hit save chat um, and you'll be able to have all of these links for as long as you want them. They'll be downloaded as a text file.
Um, all right, so Tiffany is asking if it's possible to keep all the bus stops. Um, and the answer to that is no. Um, so we ran into some design difficulties um, near the Way Bossett um, intersection with Cummins Highway um, because there's the gas station, there's some turning movements we have to account for, some extra driveways and other complicated pieces. So that bus stop, um, we are actually sort of like sliding it down the street um, to be closer, um, well, in between uh, like rugby and um, Itasca, although it changes name on the other side of the street. Um, so uh, it's a little bit further um, from where it is located today, um, but if we moved it behind that intersection, it would be basically in the place where the bus stop at Kennebec is. Um, and if we moved it, so that's kind of the, the balance there. Um, the, the other bus stop that we are um, proposing to remove um, doesn't have, there isn't a way to have a safe crosswalk over Cummins Highway. Um, so we're aiming for people to use um, the stops that are closer to Kennebec or at um, Wood Harvard. Um, so there are only um, sort of three that are being removed in total um, on both sides of the street combined. But um, if you look at the interactive map, you can see how it's, um, you know, we're trying to make up for not making it so far away um, when we have to move those around. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions or hands raised. Um, so I think we'll close out the meeting. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, it's really great to talk with you and hear your concerns and keep those in mind as we're moving forward. Um, as a reminder, we have that meeting on February 23rd for Cummins Highway about street trees um, and our colleagues in the Parks Department are gonna be coming and talking about the urban forest plan. Um, so please be sure to check that out. Um, it'll be recorded and posted if you can't make it that evening. Um, and we look forward to um, seeing you soon. Bye everyone.